the revival of the Ummah is not uh, creating a political system. It would have been easy. A state with a ruler implements Islam, that's it. Mm. And in fact, it would be impossible in the times of globalization. Mm. It is about recreating the civilization itself. Do you think uh, AI could one day replace a mushtahid? Wallahu alam. I don't know. We often hear from Muslims that our ummah suffers from disunity on a local, national and international level. Slight differences of opinion can cause major divisions. Our countries remain deeply divided between themselves and there is an impression that has consolidated that we will not be able to recover our position. This situation has led to despondency, a helplessness and in the extreme an acceptance of the current status quo. But is this written? Is there anything we can do about our parlous state of affairs? Have we come to the end of Muslim civilization and are we now merely managing decline? Are we waiting for the Mahdi, a leader who will change our situation and until then we are helpless? Or is there anything we can do about our current predicament? To help us understand the issues of unity and division from an Islamic perspective, I have invited Dr. Shoaib Wani. He is the director and co-founder of Darul Ilm Institute. He grew up in Indian-occupied Kashmir and started his quest to learn Islamic ulum during his schooling years. He completed his foundational Islamic studies in India and then moved to Al-Azhar University, Egypt. He devoted 10 years studying advanced Islamic studies, specializing in Usul al-Fiqh at the International Islamic University, Malaysia. Dr. Wani holds a PhD in The Legal Thought of Imam Shafi, which was published in 2021. He has over 20 years' experience of teaching Islamic uloom and he lives in Istanbul with his family. Dr. Shaib Wani, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome to The Thinking Muslim. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Zakallah khairan for having me. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us sincerity and make this engagement fruitful. I mean, I mean, Jazakallah khair. It's really a pleasure and honor to have you with us today Barakallah. here in Istanbul. Now, let's start with the current situation of the Muslim Ummah. We face so much disunity. Is our current situation typical of Muslim history or are we living in an unprecedented situation in unprecedented times? Bismillah, walhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. Amma ba'd, the Ummah lacks a goal, maqsidul wujud, the maqsid of existence. So it's like uh, constructing a house. We have the bricks, we have the tools, mm. we have uh, the human resource to some extent, we have it at our disposal, but we don't know how to do it. Or we may be doing it, but in a wrong way. So the ummah needs a vision, a mission, a push towards its raisin dietary. In the time of the Prophet وسلم, we had divisions hmm. and the Quran maintained these divisions. Like the famous uh, classification of the Sahaba between Al-Muhajirun and Al-Ansar. Mm -hmm. In the battlefield also, the Prophet وسلم, maintained this uh, classification and division. Yes. But in spite of that, they were agreed on something higher. So though in my opinion, Ummah lacks this vision and uh, I feel that ikhtilaf is intrinsic to all great civilizations mm. it is important because uh, particularly the ummah the Muslim ummah uh, has engaged human beings across the spectrum mm. it is a huge civilization in history different races ethnicities colors cultures for this reason, from uh, the principles of uh, usul, or a very important evidence we have is al-urf, custom. Acknowledging the different customs, and it, it, it is an, it's a legal evidence, imagine. It's not only acknowledging it, but it has become a legal device for ahkam. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew, and it was in his divine plan, and the Prophet some sahaba knew that uh, the ummah will expand. So when you have a great ummah, and the greatness is unprecedented in history. Uh, ikhtilaf will happen. But we have to learn the skill of regulating that khilaf, understanding it. Or we can say, adopting create, creative imagination. Mm. 
in cultivating the khilaf for higher purposes. Ikhtilaf will not dissolve. So this is, in my opinion, what we need to do and understand. So I want to expand on, I want you to expand on what we mean by regulating differences in a second. But when we speak to the ordinary Muslim, like we could walk in the streets of Istanbul and come across normal people, ordinary people, and automatically they would say, today we are deeply divided. You go to any country in the world. I mean, I was just an example. I was speaking to my relative in, in South Africa, and he said the number one problem the Muslim Ummah faces is division. And often they will recall hadith that the Prophet ﷺ talked about a time will come when we will be deeply divided. Can you shed light, Sheikh Shoaib, on these ahadith, these narrations, and whether they are applicable to our time today? Coming to the hadith, we can talk about it theologically, and yani, I don't want to go into that discussion. Yeah. But generally speaking, the hadith, uh, which has been recorded by Imam Abu Dawood in his Sunan, about the division of the Ummah into 73 sects. Hmm. The scholars of hadith have uh, serious disagreement about the matn of this hadith. Right. Matn being? The, the text okay. of this hadith. Yes. They talk about the chains also. Because the matn says uh, the Jews and the Christians, they divided into 71 and 72 sects. Mm. The ummah will divide into 73. So this is a worst ummah, not the best ummah. Mm. So according to minority, I'm not saying... And the majority of the hadith scholars, they accept this hadith. Mm. It's acceptable. But mm. there is a minority. Yeah. Some muhaddithun, they cause doubt on the authenticity of this hadith because of the matn. They say this uh, is against the Qur'an, mm. contradicts the Qur'an. Because Qur'an clearly has established the fact that this ummah is khayr ummah. Now this 71, 72, 73, mm. this has become a worst ummah. Yeah. And then there is something very important in this hadith, the matn. Uh, the Prophet وسلم, he said this ummah will divide into 73 sects. Yeah. All of them are in halfa, illa wahida, except one. And then we have this construct of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. In my personal opinion, I have researched this hadith for a very long time. This kulluha yeah. finnar is shadh. Shadh means. It's odd. Okay. Shadh is uh, hadith. In hadith terminology, means it's odd. Right. It's an addition, interpolation. Right. Kulluha uh, finnar. This is the illa in the hadith. Defective uh, yani, interpolation in this hadith. Mm. So, this hadith is speaking about the division. The problem is when you say kulluha finnar, all of them are in hellfire. Mm. So, yes, there is division, there is ikhtilaf. And we have the famous classification of ikhtilaf into uh, accepted and rejected. It is there, well known. Mm. But we have to understand the fact that ikhtilaf is something intrinsic yeah. to human existence. Right. This is important. So it, the problem is not ikhtilaf. The problem is the division we have in uh, different aspects of uh, in, the, in the Muslim ummah, different aspects of human life. Are we controlling them? Mm. Our political system, is it ours? And then we have ikhtilaf. Our leaders are disagreeing on, on different points. Mm. Uh, economic system, it doesn't belong to us. The reality... And this is, I think, the greatest challenge of the Ummah, that the Ummah on ground, the Muslims, are living in times where the reality is totally alien to their worldview. Mm. This is the issue. Explain so, that. How, how is it alien to our worldview? Because the reality is Western. Mm. Yeah, and it, even it influences us, even in understanding Islam. Right. Understanding of a religion. So... Uh, we must understand these terms. Understanding terminology is very important. Mm -hmm. Like we have the, the great uh, linguistic philosophers in Islam differentiating between ikhtilaf and khilaf. Yeah. They say ikhtilaf is praiseworthy. Ikhtilaf is good. Ikhtilaf, uh, explain that. So we, being... we, we have to translate it yes. as diversity. Diversity, okay. Right? And khilaf, discord, disunity. Ah. They, they both uh, belong to the same root. But they differentiate. So, uh, to understand this is, is very important. And um, the division which happens mm -hmm. usually mm -hmm. between the Muslims on the ground level is artificial. Yes. It has been created. Yeah, I take the example of fiqhi. 
اختلافات yes. I come from a conflict zone كشمير yeah. يعني uh, we are struggling uh, for our existence every moment and the religious discourse which is being promoted in these places focuses on uh, how should we wipe on our socks mm. should we pray 8 or 20 mm-hmm. so this is a problem so understanding these matters is important so let's talk about ikhtilaf when it comes to or khilaf maybe when it comes to islamic jurisprudence uh, you are an islamic scholar and you know that it is often the case that the divisions between muslims on uh, fiqhi issues turns into major divisions you may go to a community and they would have two or three masajid based on uh, their differences of opinion when it comes to how they view Islamic jurisprudence. Now, you've made a very interesting point, I think, a few times now, that differences isn't a problem. It's how we regulate those differences. So how does Islam show us or tell us how to regulate these differences that may exist on a jurisprudence level? Yes, the, again, the answer is regulating each, uh, ikhtilaf okay. on all levels, not yes. only in jurisprudence, yes. but at the level of worldview. Mm. We must learn from the West how they have regulated and contained their khilaf. Mm. And Quran speaks about ikhtilaf between Jews and Christians. Right. It is a serious ikhtilaf. Mm. The God of Christians is the fake prophet of the Jews. Mm. This is a serious ikhtilaf. We don't have, we don't have ikhtilaf to such a level, yes. even between Shias and Sunnis. Yes. Some sects may be to the extreme, mm. but look to this khilaf, and yet they are united. The Jews, the Christians, the the world order. So, uh, regulating khilaf is important. I said, we must understand that ikhtilaf is intrinsic to human existence. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself, mm. understanding him is based on ikhtilaf. Right. Yani, uh, the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm. They're opposites. Ikhtilaf. Ikhtilaf. Yes. The names and attributes of Allah. Allah, mercy. Allah is mercy. Allah... Uh, has uh, uh, revenge, the attribute of revenge, hmm. ghadab, anger, mercy, so on and so forth. The attributes are opposites. And in fact, this creation has been, has been uh, the manifestation of the attributes in the creation, in the existence is very clear. We have this beautiful hadith uh, in Sunan al-Tirmidhi and uh, other books of hadith about ikhtisamu al-mala'i al-a'la. Hmm. The ikhtisam means argumentation. اختلاف خصم is the opponent in Arabic okay. اختصام الملاي الآلة ملاو الآلة are the angels ملاو الآلة the higher realm and if you reflect on this hadith the Prophet ﷺ saw a dream and it has the details the اختلاف اختصام has been used for fruitful discussion in this hadith uh, the Prophet ﷺ told the Sahaba that do you know about the اختصام of the ملاو الآلة they discuss about al-kafarat the deeds which uh, erase the sins al-darajat the voluntary actions which raise your levels the the term ikhtisam is not uh, appropriate if we look from the apparent meaning so mm. malaw ala is also uh, the ikhtilaf is present in malaw ala and uh, ikhtilaf was present in the times of the Prophet So regulating ikhtilaf means understanding the praiseworthy ikhtilaf and the rejected ikhtilaf. So give me understanding an example. Understanding the yeah. classification. So give me an example of a praiseworthy ikhtilaf. Praiseworthy ikhtilaf is uh, using ikhtilaf as a principle of epistemology. Hmm. Using ikhtilaf uh, as a principle which fosters and nurtures knowledge. So, for example, we have the great faqih, Al-Imam Malik, rahimahullah. Mm. His work, Muatta, is the first book of hadith which has reached us. Yes. In his times, the great Khalifa, Abu Ja'far al-Mansur, he requested Imam Malik to compile a work of law mm. so that he can implement it in the Khilafah, make it the law of the land. Right. Abu Ja'far al-Mansur. And in that he says... It has been narrated that he said to Imam Malik, avoid the rukhas of Ibn Abbas, the easy opinions of Ibn Abbas <laughs> in, in, your, in that work, mm-hmm. the shada'id of Ibn Umar, the strong 
opinions of Ibn Umar and the Shawath of Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiyallahu anhum and the odd opinions of Abdullah bin Mas'ud so Shawath meaning the odd opinions odd opinions okay. and, are opi- and this this practice it uh, it went to the four schools as well yani yes. we have mufradat right of all imams this is specific with a particular madhab so no the, one shares it right so the khalifa Shaf, so the khalifa is saying to imam malik we would like to have a centralized law yes. for everyone but we, i would like you to avoid it must these be balanced problems. it must because, be balanced okay uh, yani i have to implement it across the spectrum right right i will not implement it only in medina so he wants to implement it in medina in baghdad Everywhere. in really okay everywhere okay but imam malik did not agree why imam malik appreciated uh, the methodology of uh, abu jafar al mansur hmm. in compiling this work yani avoid the the, the shawad and rukhas and he, he said wallahi qad allamani at tasnif he taught me how to compile masail hmm. but he did not agree he said because sahaba have scattered they have students they have opinions there is disagreement i don't want to erase this disagreement because it's fruitful mm. it will nurture knowledge and same is the case with the great umar ibn abdul aziz the eighth umayyad khalifa hmm. umar ibn abdul aziz yeah. is known as the fifth khalifa rashid yeah uh, it has been narrated from him that he said i never wish that sahaba would have never agreed hmm. the agreement of the sahaba is a rahma yes And for this reason, we see that uh, the early scholars would dislike the term khilaf mm. for disagreement. Right. So if uh, in their majalis, any student would say, this is ikhtilafi matter, or there is khilaf, mm. like it has been narrated from Imam Ahmad and others, mm. he would say, don't say khilaf, call it sa'ah, call it vastness. Mm. So using ikhtilaf as a principle of epistemology, when you rely on only one scholar his understanding mm. one mind allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us different minds different capabilities allah has made us different allah has uh, and uh, this tashajur another term for uh, ikhtilaf is tashajur i'm focusing on terminology yes. terminology is very intrinsic yeah. to every civilization the great uh, scholar of arabic literature he was a mu'tazili al jahid established any he says لكل قوم الفاظ every nation has terminology mm. so the revival is also based on terminology that's why we are discussing i'm using uh, terms here and there great so ikhtilaf ikhtisam tashajur tashajur meaning tashajur is uh, debate mm. tashajur it comes from shajara mm. shajara also has the, uh, it doesn't come from shajara shajara also has the same root mm. the tree Because yeah. tree is diverse branches, right. uh, leaves, fruits, diversity. Yes. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has uh, compared uh, the, the example of al-kalimat uh, al-tayyiba, al-shahada, the pure word, the, the, the foundation of our deen, hmm. is the example of a tree. Asluha thabitun wa far'uha fi sama And this is the greatest example for ijtihad. Yes. So tashajur. And in some hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu compared a believer with a tree. Very famous hadith, the, the date palm tree. So tashajur is intrinsic. Hmm. Erasing it means erasing knowledge. So using it as an epistemological principle, cultivating it, benefiting from different minds. That's why for this reason, I think, and this is a theological uh, uh, point, we must correct our theological position yeah. uh, about ikhtilaf also. Yani, uh, uh, yearning for certainty yes. in all matters okay. is against the Islamic view of life. It's against our worldview. Uh, for example, you will hear some uh, people who uh, reject the hadith. They say, how can we rely on uh, the narrators? Mm. After all, they're human beings. Right. Knowledge is not certain. So yearning for certainty is wrong. For this reason, the texts which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed, they're not all definitive. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the texts which are mostly speculative. So that people think. Mm. The principle of ibtila. If, if we uh, define Islam or the purpose of life in one 
word. It is the qanun al-ibtila. The qanun, the principle of test. Mm. We are here for ibtila. But ibtila in two things. Ibtila in our action. Yani, uh, how we act, how we obey the commands of Allah and His Messenger. Actualizing the will of Allah in space and time. Yes. And ibtila in ijtihad. Ibtila in how we understand His will. How we understand uh, the wahi. And uh, some great scholars like Imam al-Shafi'i, rahimullah, in jurisprudence, he pointed to this very early in the beginning of his al-Risala. He says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has tested the, the human beings, particularly Muslims, in two things. In action, how they implement this deen in their personal life, collective life, and in ibtala fil ijtihad. In ijtihad. So, uh, I think uh, ikhtilaf is intrinsic. And it must be cultivated in understanding our religion, understanding the reality, benefiting from different minds, benefiting from uh, the different experiences. We can benefit from civilizations as well. Mm. There is civilization exchange always. Islamic civilization was never a closed civilization. Right. So cultivating can have these different meanings and manifestations. So this is a very interesting uh, point you raise here because I was going to talk today i wanted you i I've, I've invited you here to talk about the divisions that exist between us but we've started with jurisprudence divisions and your response is really that this is not a problem in fact this ends up helping the ummah it creates creativity it makes muslims think more deeply about their matters but you do also know that there is a movement today amongst muslims to try to unify fiqh opinions because uh, there is this understanding that maybe things have gone too far mm. and maybe there's too many differences of opinions that exist so i suppose i've got two questions here why does this movement exist to unify opinions and is it a healthy movement to have within the ummah in my opinion it is uh, influenced by western modernity ah this yearning for one fiqh one opinion one law one theology mm. is uh an influence, alien influence. We never had this. Really? We are talking about Malik. Yeah. We're talking about Sahaba. The Prophet himself, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Yeah. This is our deen. The Prophet, the Sahaba, the Wahi. Yeah. Nothing else. So the Prophet himself, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, disagrees with other Prophets. Yeah. In law. Do Prophets agree in their law? Why, why is there disagreement in law? Yeah, true. And in fact, the laws of the previous prophets, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls it shackles in the Quran. Mm -hmm. Burden. Imagine. Mm -hmm. if this prophet, the last prophet has come to lift al-aghlal from you. The burden mm -hmm. and the shackles. So the prophets are disagreeing in law. Yeah. Why? Because every law came to a particular nation considering its reality. Reality of the human beings also. And this is a very deep topic in, in anthropology, uh, maybe sociology, reality of human beings of the past, real, reality of their society. Uh, the prophets are disagreeing. The Sahaba are disagreeing. Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, a particular Sahabi in every area of, of the Muslim lands in those times yeah. who has his own fiqh. Yani, Abdullah bin Abbas in Mecca, Abdullah bin Omar in Medina, Abdullah bin Mas'ud in in uh, Iraq, the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and radiyallahu anhun, they are disagreeing. Our mother Aisha radiyallahu anha, she disagreed with other Sahaba in more than 150 matters. Really, and scholars have compiled works on that. So, this is intrinsic. That's why it's intrinsic to to Islam. Uh, erasing it. Unifying the Ummah on one, is it possible before we do it? Is it even possible? Hmm. It means erasing the different ethnicities, cultures, different uh, <clears throat> realities of the Ummah. Yeah. Is it possible? I don't think uh, it has ever been uh, the main uh, concern of the Ummah hmm. in our history. And it is not possible. Uh, we have some contemporary scholars, like we have the Egyptian scholar Sayyid Sabiq. Hmm. Yeah. He wrote Fiqh Sunnah in that he tried to hmm. uh, create Compile, a yeah. nah, he, create a balanced opinion in between. It, it, it doesn't work. And another point we must understand about Fiqhi Maddas. Generally, yani, 
uh, we should not be focusing on only fiqh. Yes. We should talk about our worldview in general. True. In theological matters also. Yes. We don't have disagreement at the core. Mm. We, we have disagreed about the branches. We have disagreed about the details. Mm. You know, between Muslims, who disagrees about uh, oneness of God? Uh, the prophethood. Uh, the Sahaba. Yani, there are some sects who go to the extreme sometimes. Mm. We have one Quran. Mm. We have yani, the, 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 the text is, Muslims are unified on the text. They are unified on the, the Prophet of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And in, if, you, if you study Ilm al-Kalam in theology, we don't disagree on, on, on the basic matters. The disagreement is on how they understood, how they cultivate this is valid ijtihad. Mm. Ijtihad can happen and is praiseworthy in my opinion in both aqidah and fiqh, aqidah and law. Yeah. But in the branches, in the furu of aqidah and in law. And law is already called furu. Yeah. So I think yeah. uh, the problem of the ummah is something else, which we mentioned in the beginning. Yeah, I, I want to pick up on, on uh, those issues of aqidah because uh, yes, there are Muslims who probably accept that difference of opinion on fiqh matters are a, a natural and, and we're just going to have to accept that. Most Muslims, I think, have have come to this view. But there are uh, people who argue that on aqidah matters, uh, only one school is correct. So, for example, I was speaking to a very good friend of mine and he said that he's not going to listen to such and such scholar because he's an ashari. So in aqidah matters or, you know, uh, you were here on when I produce an episode. You, someone will write in the comments that the Ottomans should be rejected because they followed the maturity. Ma maturity okay, yes. so uh, how do we understand that level of because that seems very fundamental that we're we're effectively cancelling a whole uh, a whole community of scholars because of their affiliation to a particular arcade matter. I think we have become reductionist in hmm. that approach. Hmm. And reductionism is another problem. Mm. Who is, what is Asharism? Who is Al Imam Abu al Hassan al Ash'ari? Mm. He was a great mind. Right. He uh, practiced ijtihad mm. in Aqidah. Right. Who is Abu Mansur al Maturidi? Another great mind. Why are we not able to engage with these great minds, understand their legacy, cherish it, mm. base the understanding of contemporary Islam on what they did. Mm. Yani, this is our problem, reductionism. So uh, the problem is not engaging with it, not understanding it properly, uh, not studying these ulum. Mm. There's uh, this opinion of uh, the civilizational exchange. All ulum have come from others. Ilm al-Kalam is... Uh, uh, a Greek influence, uh, logic, fit, logic, logic, logic Kalam, mantiq, yeah. Yeah. Uh, as if uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not speak about aql. Yeah. Yani logic at the core is using aql, right? Mm. Cherishing aql. Mm. There can be some details about which we disagree based on our own worldview, yeah. but no one disagrees about using aql. Aql is a great ni'mah. And this is connected with ikhtilaf in the Quran also. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talked about ikhtilaf uh, in in uh, the day and the night, ikhtilaf of the languages, ikhtilaf of the ethnicities. And then Allah says, there are signs for ulul albab. Yeah. Ulul albab. People of lub albab. Lub means those uh, people who use aql to its utmost potential. So, uh, and if, if for example, the mainstream three, ahlu sunnah, mm. call, it, uh, call them, uh, and even this term, Ahlu Sunnati Wal Jama'ah, yeah. is very cosmetic. Mm. Everyone calls himself Ahlu Sunnah. And the problem is also about the sources. For example, how do you understand Mu'tazila, their legacy? Yeah. We don't have sources. So if we engage with the famous, the Athari school, the yani, Aqidah based on purely textual evidences, mm. uh, the Ash'aris and the Maturidis, if you study them, you will not find any uh, basic disagreement. They all agree. Yeah. They disagree on the details. Right. And if we were able to cherish it and use it in our times of skepticism, doubts, 
we know how these things are destroying our youth in the Muslim world. Mm. Uh, for this reason, the early scholars would uh, feel uh, and they would encourage uh, ilmul kalam. We must have uh, yani, a scholar who uh, fulfills fardu kifaya in this matter, who can address the doubts. When you don't know philosophy, you don't know uh, logic, you don't know uh, Western social sciences, uh, you are reductionist even in understanding your own texts. How will you, uh, how will you address hmm. these problems? How, yes. will, how, how will you engage? Yes. How, how will you create a modern uh, Islamic civilization? Because uh, the revival of the Ummah is not uh, creating a political system, in my opinion. Hmm. It would have been easy. A state with a ruler implements Islam, that's it. Hmm. And in fact, it would be impossible in the times of globalization. Hmm. It is about recreating the civilization itself. We're talking about this civilization. And civilization is a big project. So if we don't know these things, we cannot. So in my opinion, reductionism is the problem. Uh, and <clears throat> the scholars are not updating themselves yeah. beyond engaging with their legacy. Yeah. So can I actually ask you about Mu'tazila as a school of thinking? Now, my understanding is that Mu'tazila is outside of the Ahlul Sunnah branch. So the free schools you mentioned of Aqidah, they come within what you term the acceptable uh, opinions within Islam. But Mu'tazila stands outside of that, particularly because of their extreme rationality. How did early Islamic scholars view Mu'tazila? Did they see them as part of a, a branch of Islam or did they see them to be outside of Islam, effectively unbelievers? The problem we face in understanding the Mu'tazila is the sources. Hmm. We don't have the original sources. Right we take the information from the opponents, mm. from the books of Ashaira. And the majority of the works about uh, the sects yeah. has been compiled by Ashaira. Right. Like uh, the main work of uh, Imam Abu Hassan al-Ash'ari, Milal and Nihal. So we don't know. We have uh, access to some works. And understanding uh, a sect or a group or an ideology from its opponents is not the correct way right. to approach this. Right. We will uh, lack objectivity mm. in that engagement. Mm. And recently some works have been published about the Mu'tazila. Yeah. The approach generally is that Muslims, right. the 72 sects are Muslims. Yeah. And even the scholars who are deemed extreme in their ideology, they have agreement on this, like Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah. He says 72 sects are Muslims, really? very clearly. Really? Except fringe elements and uh, very extreme uh, sects. Hmm. So they are Muslims. However, they criticized the methodology. But it's very interesting to note, they, that's why this ikhtilaf, regulating, they engaged yeah. with them, they cherished it. Really? Uh, who doesn't, from the Mufassirun, the mainstream Mufassirun, who does not uh, use uh, the book of Imam al-Zamakhshari, al-Kashaf, He's Mu'tazila? He's a Mu'tazila. Really? A Sheikh al and yeah. he, he would, uh, he would uh, take pride in that. Yeah. It's very famous when Imam uh, Zamakhshi would visit a person and knock on the door and uh, uh, he would introduce himself. Mm. Uh, if the person would ask who is there, he would say Sheikh al <laughs> I'm the Sheikh of Mu'tazila. Yes. So they, they accept it. And we can learn from Mu'tazila in many matters. Yeah. So we can learn from them. Like, for, for example, it's very famous about Mu'tazila that they reject the Sunnah, right? But the book of Al-Imam Al-Balkhi, famous Mu'tazili, mm. was published recently about the riwayah, uh, the, the hadith. In that, he endorses Khabar Ahad. Okay. And it's very interesting to see the Mu'tazili influence on the Hanafi uh, hadith terminology. Mm. Because Hanafis have extra conditions. They disagree in, in the conditions with the, the majority. Mm -hmm. So Hanafis were influenced by the Mu'tazila in their Hadith terminology. And it's really clear. And Mu'tazila were influenced by some Mu'tazila, by uh, Imam Shafi, the work of Shafi. So you see influence. Yeah. They're benefiting from each other. And in our times, we're fighting on their names. Yeah. This is a problem. So yes, we have to maintain the mainstream. We have to maintain uh, the usul. We have to maintain the qat'iyat, al-kulliyat, the higher objectives, usul, principles of religion. But at the same time, we can engage. And I see great diversity in our legacy, wallahi. 
Yeah. I sometimes listen to Shia scholars as well. Mm. I don't have any problem in that. Mm. We should learn. Uh, that's why I said we should learn from the West. See yes. the political divide. Yes. Left and right. Yes. They engage. We lack this engagement mm. because we have lost the catalyst, the push. Yeah. So this is really, really interesting because there is this movement in Ummah to, in, in some in the Ummah, to reunite the Muslims. And that's a great, great plan, right? And one idea is that we need to have a coherent state, a government with a clear constitution that's going to inevitably uh, adopt uh, a madhab or a, a way of thinking. You're effectively arguing this would be out of sync with the Islamic Ummah in the past because we never really had a situation where you had a centralized uh, system uh, and and is the Islamic fiqh was applied centrally from central government. Is that a am I reading your uh, your your points correctly here? We had some Khulafa did that. Ah. And we 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 know that the Hanafi Madhab was implemented in the Abbas Khilafah and in the Ottoman, in, in yeah, the Uthmani Khilafah yeah, as well. Yeah, we had that. Yeah, and we can do that again. Hmm. Uniting uh, politically, yes, creating a political system. Uniting yeah. politically, we can do that, and it would be another experience. We can learn from the experience. Mm. But I quoted the scholars; the scholarship never accepted that. Ah. So I think we should focus on the higher principles, higher goals, raising territory, as I said. So we unify on the we big unify matters. on the big matters ah. and leave the diversity in the branches. Leave it. But can learn I, from it? Yeah. So there is. I'll give you another another opinion, another point. Um, so again, I, I have a lot of friends who say to me that one of the symbols of our disunity is the moon sighting issue. So we have many communities, even in the West, for example, in Britain, you would have multiple, maybe sometimes free uh, Ramadan beginnings or free Eids uh, would would be uh, evident in a single community because they follow different methodologies to uh, to come to a conclusion about moon sighting. Some follow scientific uh, moon sighting evidence, some follow the, the uh, sighting, some, there are many, uh, many methods. Um, uh, is it correct for, for the sake of unity to try to get all of these diverse opinions to follow one opinion? I don't think it is correct. Really? Because this ikhtilaf, uh, in this example, for, uh, in this mas'ala, for example, yeah. is based on the texts. Ah. We have texts in that. We have the hadith of Sahih Muslim Yes, about uh, the difference in matala. If Abdullah ibn Abbas did not do it, radiyallahu mm -hmm. why should we do it? Leave it. We should unite on the purpose of Eid. What is the purpose of Eid? Okay, yes. We miss that. Hmm. This is the reductionism. Yeah. We focus on the masail. How how to uh, yani, how to celebrate our Eid? When to celebrate our Eid? What is the purpose of Eid? Hmm. What is the purpose of extra takbirat? Yes. In the prayers of Eid. Praising uh, Allah, what does it mean? So the unity is good. But we have to define these terms. Brother Jalal, we have to define these terms in a profound manner. We have to theorize for the Ummah. Yeah. This is what we lack. West has been theorizing uh, from its renaissance. We had great minds in the past. Now we have fallen into reductionism. Yeah. So uh, we must define unity. It, it, it should not be cosmetic. Mm -hmm. It should not be uh, unity, uh, superficial unity. Yeah. We have to unite in thought. And this thought also should be uh, defined. I said kulliyat, focus mm -hmm. on kulliyat. Mm -hmm. Because we are Muslims. We believe in wahi. This is the khairiyah we have in the ummah. The khair, yani, kuntum khair ummatin. Khairiyah is in the wahi. Yeah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called this wahi khair, mm -hmm. in another words. Yeah. So understanding this khair and presenting it uh, to the mankind with its diversity is important. Yeah, can so I? I'll, yeah. I'll tell you a very interesting Please. point. Yeah, the text, the nature of the texts. Mm. Why did Allah Subhanahu wa Taala select the lost and find messenger from the Arabs? Yes. The nature of Arabic language. Arabic language is very vast, diverse. Like Imam al Shafi'i rahimullah, he says, "La biha illa nabi." No one can encompass 
the Arabic language with its diversity and intricacies, except the Prophet. It's diverse. Yes. So we have this mas'ala which is discussed uh, about the non-Arabic terminology or words in the Qur'an. Mm. So one answer to that is that the non, like Ibrahim, al mamnu min al-sarf, we call this in grammar. Uh, one uh, answer to this is that perhaps this came from, because the Semitic languages, mm. they share many things. I heard a scholar saying, uh, a contemporary scholar from Morocco, he said, al-ibriyatu ukhtu al-arabiyya. Hebrew is sister of Arabic. Mm. So the diversity in the text, which you claim, and this is uh, the khayriya we have. Without wahi, we are nothing. Mm. This is the khayriya. And Imam al-Shatibi, a great legal mind of the ummah, yeah. rahimahullah. And his focus was also kulliyat, the higher objectives of law, mm. the higher objectives of language. Maqasid. Maqasid. Yeah. Maq but maqasid in law, mm. maqasid in language. Mm. He wrote a great commentary on Alfiya, the famous. Really? Right. But in that, he did not discuss the, he talked about furu, but his aim was focusing on kulliyat. And he wanted to compile a work about nafsiya, kulliyat of tasawwuf. Okay. But he was not able to do that. He says a very interesting thing in Al-Muwafaqat, the great uh, legal work of Shatibi. He says, the Arabic words are of different types. We know that. The category of an-nas, nas, nas in Arabic uh, can have a general meaning, text, or the ayah of Quran, the hadith. Okay. Yeah. But this is, a, this is in, in, technically, it means a word which has only one meaning. Mm. It's definitive. He says in the Quran, in our texts, primarily the Quran and the hadith, an-nasu imma ma'adumun wa imma nadir. This nas category, a word which has only one meaning, mm. is either non-existent or rare. Really? So this shows the diversity in the text itself. How can we, we uh, should cherish diversity? Because the wahi is diverse. And the practice of the Prophet, as I said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We have this famous hadith of Banu Quraidah. Mm. And this is happening in, uh, in uh, battle, warfare. Yeah, explain the hadith to us. The famous hadith recorded by Imam al-Bukhari and others. After the battle of Ahzab, warfare, the Prophet is teaching the Ummah the principles of civilization, mm -hmm. how to engage, how to understand things. Right. Uh, Banu Quraidah is the Jewish tribe which uh, practiced treachery against the Prophet Sallallahu I will not go into the story. Yeah. The hadith says the Prophet Sallallahu said to the Sahaba, لا يصلين أحدكم إلا في بني كريضة right. الأسرة إلا في بني كريضة No one from you should pray Asr except when you reach the fortresses of Bani كريضة So this, he send in, this is the hadith. He's sending the battle group to Bani كريضة yeah, to, to, uh, Because they uh, yeah. breached the agreement. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But the point here is, he did not explain it. He said, you, you pray Asr, you have to reach the fortresses of Banu Qurayza. Okay. Now the time of Asr came while they were going there and they, in, the, in the middle of the journey. Now what should they do? Mm -hmm. Quran, the principle says, pray on time. Yes. Kitab al Asr, pray on time. Mm -hmm. they the Sahaba disagreed. One jama'ah, they said, uh, we will pray when we reach uh, Banu Qura, the fortresses of Banu Qura. Even if that means praying after Isha, we don't care. Because the Prophet we will stick to the uh, literal meaning, right. to the letter of the law. Right. So they may miss the Salah, but they will stick with letter the, of the, the command. Okay. Command. Yes. Letter of the, the apparent meaning. Yes. Another group, they said, no, the, the Prophet did not mean this. Mm. Now this is going into the spirit of the law. Let's yes. apply our understanding. The Prophet was not focusing on Salatul Asr. The Prophet meant we should reach Banu Quraidha quickly mm. before they do something which harms us. To so make haste. Haste, reach there quickly. Right. So he did not mean that. Mm. We should pray now because we stick to the Asr of the Quran. Mm. Now they applied Ijtihad. This is the first uh, instance of Ijtihad practiced by the Sahaba. When the news reached the Prophet Sallallahu the Prophet did not rebuke anyone. Mm. The pro Prophet could have said, you're right and you're wrong. He did not. He acknowledged. And this is happening in the battle. The Prophet is teaching the Sahaba principles of understanding. Right. Diversity. Importance of diversity. 
That's very, very interesting. Um, so that then leads to the discussion about uh, the ethics or the other of the, uh, the way in which we disagree. Um, so again, today, we often have major disagreements based on our fiqhi opinion and we fall out. I mean, on social media, you will notice that uh, people often fall out with one another based on these fiqhi disagreements, right? So did the scholars uh, delineate what the appropriate adab should be when we have differences of opinion? We have a whole genre, a particular genre of uh, literature hmm. in this masala. Really? The other manuals about ikhtilaf. Books on books, ikhtilaf, really? Books. And uh, the scholars, they discussed this in the science of usul al-fiqh, hmm. when they talked about ijtihad and ikhtilaf, how to disagree. Yes. We cannot go into the details. However, sure. uh, we can say that uh, it revolves a around the classification of uh, disagreement. Right. We should not disagree in the principles of Islam. And even if, if we disagree, how to engage with it. Right. For example, the muhaddithun, they differentiate between uh, in bid'ah, innovation, clear innovation. Mm. Narrator is an innovator. Mm. Should we accept his narration or not? Mm. They engage. The a modern Muslim would say, how, how come? We reject him. He's a, maybe a kafir. We, we don't accept it. Mm. The muhaddithun, they say, no, we will see. Is he a caller to his innovation or not? Mm. If he calls to his innovation, we will not accept his narration. So like if he's a public Yeah, he's it, right, if, right. He, if he preaches towards uh -huh, uh -huh. But if this bid'ah, and it's established bid'ah, mm. and there are principles for that, is... Uh, Specific with him, he's a not he's not a caller to his bid'ah. Yes, we will accept his narration, and Imam Al Bukhari accepted. Really, so the classification of ikhtilaf, we should not disagree in definitive matters. Al ma'loom fi dini bid darura, they call it. Mm. The matters which are known in our religion by necessity, yes. and in fact, the darura term is from logic. Yes, and the common Muslims don't realize it. Really. Classifying knowledge into daruri and nadari is from logic. The so everyone necessity, necessity, necessity okay. definitive. Yeah. yeah, like uh, salah is obligatory, yeah. zina is uh, haram. Mm. Basic uh, ibadat, rituals, uh, public life, culture. Uh, we have basic ahkam in that. Mm -hmm. We should not disagree. Yes. In other areas, we can we should disagree. The question is not about uh, should we or should not. We should because uh, diversity. Yes. We should cultivate it and produce. See, the four madhahib, the great madhahib yeah. we produced in aqidah, in fiqh, in language. Mm. Uh, if they had never disagreed, or disagreement, if they had not taken it as a principle, they would never, uh, yani, they, they would never produce such a legacy, yeah. a turaf. Sheikh, Sheikh Shreb, we have, um, and forgive me for my oversimplification here, but we have, uh, in uh, our Islamic culture, we have, Mushtahideen, we have mushtahids and we have muqallid, you know, people who follow and people who derive uh, the jurisprudence, you know, the, the scholars who derive the jurisprudence. Now, I, I often wonder whether it is the responsibility of the muqallid, so like myself, who, you know, uh, my Islamic learning is very rudimentary. I, you know, I, I would never be able to, or not, never is the wrong word, I'm, I'm not able to uh, to derive the uh, ruling from the text, would it be possible for me to disagree with someone on a matter of fiqh, even if I can't derive that opinion myself? Or should I stay silent on a matter if someone, for example, said, well, this is my opinion, am I allowed to engage with them and debate with them about their opinion? Or is that a useless activity for me as a muqallid? Uh, before we answer this question, we have to understand the the classification Please. mujtahid and uh, muqallid yes yani mujtahid is a muslim scholar mm. who practices ijtihad okay now we cannot go into the details yeah it will take time but generally speaking muj what mujtahid does is he uh, uh, applies his usul he has principles of extracting the ahkam mm. from the book of allah mm. and sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam yeah and we have the scholars have talked about the conditions of mujtahid. So we can yani, uh, summarize these conditions or the area of mujtahid in, into three. Mm. We can say mujtahid engages with the texts. 
Right. He has methodology to understand the texts and he knows all the tools uh, required in that process. Yes. A mujtahid knows uh, the reality in which he lives. Yeah. And this is very important because in our times we, we are disconnected from the reality. So the Western social sciences come in. Uh -huh. A mujtahid of our times, if yeah. he does not know Western social sciences, his ijtihad will not be accepted in my right. opinion. Really? He must know the reality we're living in. Mm. Number three, he must have actually practiced ijtihad, implemented. Uh -huh. So, uh, and a muqallid is a Muslim who follows a mujtahid. Right. Particularly if the ijtihad of a particular specific mujtahid has turned into a legal system. The Hanafi madhab is not only ijtihad of Imam Abu Hanifa or Shafi or the four schools. Yeah. It has turned into a legal system nurtured by great legal minds. So for collective madhab, really. It's okay. a collective madhab. That's yeah. why you, yani, technically speaking, sometimes an opinion in Shafi madhab is not the opinion of the Imam. Uh -huh. This is very really interesting. Yeah. So a muqallid should follow a mujtahid in principle. Sure. But uh, we're living in times of information explosion. Yes. Knowledge is everywhere. Yeah. And this is from, from the signs of the last day. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, mm -hmm. and yak, uh, yak, al -qalam in some narrations, yes. the, the pen or the information will, uh, will be everywhere. So a muqallid can raise himself, right. discuss, debate. We should do that. That's why uh, al-munadhara, we talked about debate, mm. the ilm of munadhara. Again, this, is, this has to do with the diversity, ikhtilaf. Munadhara, uh, al-jadal. Uh, the science of argumentation was always connected with usul al fiqh, right. with our legacy. Yes. When discussing about the, uh, the the knowledge methodologies adopted in the eastern part of the Muslim world and the western part of the Muslim world, mm -hmm. they said the eastern part was more uh, profound. Their methodology was better because they practiced the 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 method of munadhara, of debating. Debate. Really. So munadhara is also connected with this. Mm. Yes, we can do that. It's not a problem. But when it comes to uh, practically applying your deen, you have to pray five times. Mm. You have to give zakah. You have to engage in uh, dealings, uh, uh, jihad, public life, political life. You must have a valid ishtihad. Yes. You, but, cannot, yeah. uh, you cannot just uh, engage with the text without knowing the methodology. Yeah. So... A muqallid can raise himself. That's why we have a middle category which was proposed, I think, it needs more research. It was proposed uh, by some scholars in the subcontinent. They say, muttabi, a mm. follower, mm. between muqallid and mujtahid. Who has been raised a bit, he can understand the evidences. Mm -hmm. He can engage. But this engagement must be defined. The area must be defined so that it doesn't become intellectual anarchy. Yeah. So that, that's very interesting. So you can be a muqallid, a follower, yet raise yourself to a level where you can appreciate how right, how uh, thick opinion has been, have been derived. And so you can engage in discussions about those opinions. Okay, that's, that's very, that's I a very good, yeah. Yeah, I want to add another Please. point, which is beneficial in creating uh, Islamic civilization in our age. Right. Yani engaging in the discussion about opinions, hmm. better than that, and more important than that is to engage with and understand how the scholars extracted those opinions and engaging with the methodology right. so that it can uh, enlighten our minds so that we can learn how they used to think. We have lost this thinking uh, process. Yeah. So it's not only about let's sit and discuss about the four uh, madhahib, like in prayer, for example. Yeah. We have Eid al-Adha yes. coming. Yeah. So should it be six takbirat or 12 takbirat? Let's discuss hadith from both sides, opinions. This is good, okay. But again, reductionist method. Let's talk about how, what are the principles they used? The principles of language, the akli principles, mm. rational principles they used. Uh, the principles based on Quran and Sunnah. How, how did they think? Mm. What are the ilal? What are the reasons behind adopting a particular opinion? Mm. So that... Eventually, we have to pray Eid al-Adha, Salatul salatu, uh, Eid, and it will be either six or whatever. But 
uh, this will enhance our thinking. We'll be able to think and produce mujtahideen in our times. This is our problem. We're not thinking anymore. So I, I wanted to ask you about that because do we really have mujtahideen in our times? I mean, you know, we, we often have scholars, very reputable, good scholars, but they tend to echo the opinions of the former Dahib or, you know, some very notable scholars of the past. Do we really have these level of independent thinkers who are able to derive hukum from the text today? Again, this will depend on how we define a mujtahid. Okay. If you define a mujtahid in a reductionist manner, again, uh-huh. because we're, th- yeah, we're experiencing reductionist thinking and everything. Yeah. If you define mujtahid as a person who knows four madhahib, he knows the usul, he has uh, excelled Arabic language, we have. Maybe we have a mi- minority of these scholars, but we have. Mm. But if a mujtahid is a polymath, a great scholar who fulfills these conditions, let's take two conditions only. Number one, who understands the texts in a profound manner, he has usul of understanding the texts and understanding the reality. Do we really have scholars who understand the reality? Right. I don't think so. Mm. But uh, we can have in our times, if the reality has become so complex and big, we can uh, practice the juzul ijtihad, we can break ijtihad. Yani, this is possible, scholars have talked about it. Well, explain that to me. The Jadzul Ijtihad is when we have a bench of scholars. Mm. We have an institution. Right. They sit together. Yes. They are from different areas of expertise. Yeah. They sit, sit together and engage, understand the reality and come up with a solution. Aha. So we can we can divide it into areas. Yes. Because the reality, in my opinion, has become too complex. Do you think uh, AI, artificial intelligence, could one day replace a mushtahid? Wallahu alam. I don't know. But maybe yes, I don't think it will replace a mujtahid because mm. uh, it depends on how AI works. I'm mm. not an expert in this field, but mm. uh, the creative imagination of a human being can never be replaced. Mm. Wallahu alam. Because uh, this is unique with a human being. Yes. That's why when logicians define a human being, yeah. what do they say? They say, Haywanun uh, natiq. He's a haywan, animal, but natiq. Natiq. Natiq refers to aql. Mm-hmm. So this uh, faculty of intellect and using it and the creavi- creativity Allah has kept in it is unique. I'm very sorry, I'm moving away from our central topic of unity and disunity today, but I find what you're saying very fascinating. Um, can I ask a question about mushtahideen today? If a mushtahid came along and said, I'm going to differ from all of the established madahib, uh, uh, I'm going to differ with the opinions of the majority of the scholars. But here's my rationale. Here's what I believe is a new uh, fiqh on salah or fiqh on zakah or fiqh on mu'amalat, on, on transactions. Uh, would we reject such a person or should we embrace such a person? Again, it depends on how we define ijtihad. Hmm. Coming back to the definitions. Because yeah. uh, ijtihad or mujtahidun are of two types. Yeah. This is very famous in our thought. Mujtahid mutlaq and muqayyad. Mujtahid mutlaq is a mujtahid who has his own usul. Right. So this means new usul. Can yeah. we have new usul? I don't think so, uh, personally. Yeah. And the scholars who talked about closing the gates of ijtihad, uh, some of them were uh, muhaddithun and great jurists like Imam Ibn Salah. Mm. He is from the early scholars who talked about closing the gates of ijtihad. And what they meant was, and this is an interpretation, it can have other interpretations, yeah. uh, they meant closing the gates of Mujtahid Mutlaq because ah. they consider it a marhala, a stage, which has ended. Right. So, so for this example, is the absolute Mujtahid who develops their own usul. They felt that stage was over. Now, develops is a really tricky ah. word ah. because Tadween, we have the term Tadween. The usul were already there in the book of Allah, Sunnah of the Prophet Sunnah. practice of the Sahaba. Yes. They creatively uh, engaged with these usul mm. and codified it, yes. we can say. Yeah. So for example, uh, we cannot disagree with grammar, mm. can we? Yeah. 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 Alhamdulillahi. If you say, I will not uh, read it as lillahi, why kasra? You cannot. Because this was a marhala, grammar has been codified. Right. So, if uh, uh, the stage has ended, now what we have is 
uh, ijtihad in the light of the usul which have been codified. Okay, but there is difference between al imkan al aqli and uh, uh, the actual possibility. Yeah. Yeah, is some something is possible aqlan rationally, but does it happen? So we can embrace if we have a scholar who comes with new usul, but we will we will not accept him without judging him. Mm. He has to give strong evidences because this is a religion of evidence. So imkanul aqli is is possible rationally it's possible but buku does it actually happen i don't think so sheikh shoaib i know we've spoken a lot today about the jurisprudence differences that exist within the muslims and and that's primarily because you're an islamic scholar and i i would really appreciate your views on this but of course many muslims today are not disunified necessarily by their islamic opinions they're unified by political systems. They're unified by ethnicity, by nationality. Um, can you shed some light on what Islam says about these sorts of divisions, in particular nationalism and ethnic divisions that seem to uh, divide the ummah in a very big way today? Islam appreciates, again, the diversity. Okay, We're talking about the diversity. Mm. Islam appreciates ethnicities, mm. different nations. Yeah. Maybe not nationalism as an ideology. Okay. Different races. Yes. And as I said, we have al-urf as a principle, evidence, evidence of law, custom. appreciating the custom yeah. of different uh, peoples. And it is used as a tool of interpretation. Yeah. In the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he himself appreciated the different divisions. And the divide was very intrinsic, division into tribes, ethnicities, uh, in the Arabian Peninsula. Did the Prophet Wasallam uh, work to uh, dismantle the tribes? No, he did not dismantle. Oh. He engaged. Okay. Cultivated it. Yes. So we have Al-Muhajirun, Al-Ansar. Why do you think uh, in the battle of uh, the trench, the Prophet Wasallam attributed Salman al-Farsi mm. to himself mm. when he suggested this great plot. Salman is Persian. He attributed, the Prophet ﷺ said, Salmanu minna ahl al-bayt, which means ahl al-bayt, mm -hmm. the family of the Prophet, yeah. has value as a tribe. Yes. And uh, after the Prophet ﷺ, the idea of Quraysh, Khulafa being from Quraysh, and as I said, Islamic civilization, it spread across, across the spectrum, engaged everyone. Yeah. So I don't think we have problem of racism as a hurdle. We may have uh, some manifestations, but this problem depends on primarily the identity. Yani identity of a human being, is it uh, intrinsic to his nature or, or a co construct? We don't have any identity in the modern world. Mm -hmm. In the first place, how will we disagree on our on our identities? If we had the ummah had uh, diverse identities, and then we were disagreeing, it would be logical. But we don't have. We we have to search for the identity. So the Prophet sallam, in the battles also he would maintain this division of muhajirun and ansar. Mm -hmm. This is very famous. He did not dismantle it. Yeah. We don't need to dismantle it. It is in the nature of human beings. It cannot be dismantled. Right. And the qabaliya, qawmiya, which the Prophet ﷺ criticized in the hadith, is when you turn it into something uh, which damages your worldview. Mm. So what we said is we have all these constructs, divisions, diversity. But if we discover a higher principle, it will dissolve everything. Right. If we don't have this higher principle, reason, dietary, a vision, a mission, we will not be able to dissolve. So what I'm getting from you is that, you know, a, a creative ummah will harness these, this, these divisions in inverted commas and use them for good according to an Islamic mission rather True. than try to dismantle these. True. Often we find, especially if this is in the West, we find that uh, many second generation, third generation Muslims say that the big problem in the Muslim ummah 
is our cultural differences. You know, our we have these cultures and these they inherited from our our previous generations, and these cultures uh, they cause divisions between us. Now, they may cause divisions, but your argument is that Islam did not come to eradicate those cultures. Uh, is that a is that a fair exactly, assumption? Exactly. Okay. We may have some cultural practices which are problems, which are problems uh, when you go against Islam. Yes, but Islam, 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 when it entered different areas and nations, yeah. it Islamized the cultures. Yeah, Islamized. If I can use, this is a philosophical term, hmm. pretty modern, used by uh, some great Muslim thinkers. Uh, Islamized language, Islamized cultures. Hmm. Islamized uh, thinking patterns of those people, particularly uh, the nations uh, who uh, they they had different cultural baggage: mm. the Romans, the Persians, Indian subcontinent, the Malay world. Mm. So Islam Islamizes, does not eradicate, does not destroy. Yeah. So this is a very important matter, which we must understand. There is also a discussion about um, almost say a, an, op an opinion in the Muslim Ummah that uh, we can never really recover our position ever again. Like we're doomed to disunity. Our situation now is like the Greek civilization, uh, a once uh, amazing empire civilization. Today, you know, Greece is not, it's a failed economy for, for a long period of time. It's a, it's managed its decline and now it's just a ordinary nation state. Um, is, is that type of thinking problematic? And how do we uh, remove or extricate ourselves from that way of thinking? Yes, this is not the appropriate way of thinking hmm. according in, in the Islamic perspective. Yeah. As I said, in my opinion, we are not uh, disunited. We lack something higher by which we can dissolve these uh, divisions or we can uh, creatively engage with these divisions. Yes. So we talked about theorizing. Mm -hmm. We don't have uh, the mujtahidun who can theorize for us. Yeah. Create an economic system based on Islamic principles, a political system. So we are at the receiving end. This is our problem. Yes. We are lost. If I can use Arabic terminology, because mm. this is connected with our worldview. Terminology is important. The Ummah is undergoing three conditions. Ikhtibar. Test for its survival in the modern challenges, the modern, uh, uh, the, the modern reality. Mm. Al-ikhtimar, literally fermentation. And this is something positive. Yani we have uh, the Nabiv, the the uh, date juice it becomes into khamar yes haram yes the juice is halal khamar is haram mm. and then the same thing uh, turns into uh, vinegar which is also halal yes. something beneficial yeah the umma is in uh, the middle uh, yani if we uh, use a philosophical construct yes. ikhtimar some scholars have used it mm. i'm picking from there ikhtimar yani F fermenting for fermentation, yes, brewing, yes, uh, preparing. Ah, yes. uh, okay. And it depends how we engage. Yeah. And a tea, uh, intellectual wandering. Mm -hmm. This term has been used with the greatest ummah before us, Banu Israel. Right. Arba'ina sana, forty years, yatihuna fil ard. Lost. They were lost in the desert. Mm -hmm. Lost in what? Does it mean in the desert they didn't have any culture? They had. Mm -hmm. They had families, they had kids, generations. Yeah. Everything was in place. Perhaps a difficult life in the desert. They were lost in their mission. When they left, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala delivered them from the slavery of Fir'aun. Not to live in the desert, but for a mission to reach the promised land. Yeah. They lost that sense of togetherness. Mm -hmm. They lost that raisin dietary. And yet 40 years until the old generation, was replaced with the new generation. Right. We are undergoing the same intellectual tea, you can call it in Arabic. Mm. Ikhtibar, ikhtimar, and tea. This defines, in my opinion, the present condition of the Ummah. You seem to be very hopeful 
about our present situation. But everyone you speak to, or most people I speak to, would say, you know, we are in the worst place we can ever be as a as an ummah and as a civilization. Um, uh, contrast. Explain that to me. What? What? Why? Do I get from me? Whenever I ask you a tricky question, your response is actually quite positive. I'm trying to find a, any a negativity in your responses. I explain your worldview and where this is coming from. I don't agree hmm. with this thinking. Yeah, we are living in challenging times. Yes. Umar is weak. Yeah. But if we compare, if you read uh, the history, uh, the only difference is that those times were not recorded. Now hmm. everything is recorded history. Hmm. The Mongols. The sack of Baghdad, the tension between the Sahaba, mm. the battles. What can be worse? Yani. Mm. And I'm hopeful because we're believers. And if you understand the Sunan of Allah, the divine patterns of Allah and the patterns of history, yeah. particularly our own history based on our own worldview, worldview right. we'll always have hope. See, for example, we have this hadith in which the Prophet made dua to Allah yeah. three du'as two were accepted one was rejected mm. famous hadith he said he, he made du'a oh Allah don't destroy this ummah like the destruction of the previous nations yes a complete annihilation destruction yeah don't destroy them by gharaq by drowning them mm. like the uh, flood of Nuh alayhi salam yeah and don't create discord and disunity amongst them mm -hmm. Allah accepted the two Rejected the third. Okay. Why did Allah reject the third? Famous hadith. Mm -hmm. This unity is important. Ah. Until the destruction is perfected, we cannot rise. I remember a couplet of the great uh, poet and philosopher of the East, Muhammad Iqbal. He says uh, in Urdu, he says, Zalzale se kohodar urte hai manande sahab. The earthquake causes complete destruction. And to understand the rise and fall of civilizations, mm. this is very deep. He says, like earthquake destroys Kohodar. It destroys the mountains. It destroys everything. It turns them into clouds. Mm. Complete destruction. Zalzale se vadiyome taza cheshme taza cheshmu ki numut. But the same earthquakes, they cause new valleys <laughs> with fresh streams. <laughs> so I think this is, we should be more hopeful because we have reached a point where we will rise again. Sure. Until you fall, you cannot rise. So he says, Taza the, the fresh streams will flow. <laughs> and after that he says, Har ta'amir now ko lazim hai takhreeb tamam. For every new construction necessitates uh, complete and perfect destruction mm. until it happens. And this is an ideology. We can disagree about the details. All problems of zindagi, yani the civilizational problems, this is the hal, yani this is the solution. That you understand this matter. And this applies to individuals, this applies to civilizations. So this is a very deep couplet. So I'm hopeful that Ummah will rise and we believe the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has, uh, has given us the good news. However, we should only uh, understand to engage, how to uh, uh, understand the reality around us, how to rise, work according to our capabilities, uh, dissolve these small divisions and differences. Like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Far'uha fis sama. Yani the roots must be firm. If we have a reason, Daitra, we have a principle, we have the higher goals, we have the vision. These things will remain there. Every civilization has. Mm. So I'm always hopeful. But it does not mean that we should not uh, reflect on our weaknesses. We should reflect, we should uh, introspect. Yes. Introspection is also intrinsic to every civilization. I would like to raise one last point. Uh, it's been fascinating, you know, your, your responses today, and I've learned so much from uh, how you've responded to my questions. Um, uh, there is, again, an opinion that uh, our problems are so great 
it can only really be resolved by Imam Mahdi, by a leader who is going to unify us. And until then, um, we are really destined you know, to, to manage our, our decline. I mean, how would you respond to that type of understanding? This misunderstanding is based on uh, missing the, yeah, the, the correct understanding of the term change. Mm -hmm. Change is not an incident. Change is a process. And when we reflect on the Nusus, the texts about Imam al-Mahdi, mm. uh, most of these texts, they talk about the battle, the political role. So, According to my personal opinion, he will be a political leader. It would be maybe a culmination of uh, the authority of the Ummah. Mm. But uh, there is uh, no way in Quran and Sunnah that we cannot rise before that. Uh. We will not have any uh, upliftment of the Ummah before that. I don't know. So, an Imam al-Mahdi, his, his, uh, uh, his coming and the role of the second coming of Isa alayhi salam, this is in our texts and mutawatir mm. narrated. But before that, we have texts which speak about Khilafah, which speak about the rise of the Ummah. We must uh, appreciate those texts also. We must understand all these texts together. So I don't think that before Imam, this, this is basically, again, uh, a pessimistic uh, engagement with uh, the matters of the Ummah. So we, 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 yani we wait for a person to come and change our situation. And this person, when he will come, he will come in the juncture when the Ummah has already changed in many matters. Because change does not come by only politi political authority, we have a leader. For example, if we have the best leader now, loyal to Islam, like the Sahaba, mm. and he takes uh, the position uh, of, a, of, of a leader in any country, what will he change? Mm. The economic systems are there, the political, it, it will take time. So I don't think the change will happen on ground and at the top level as well. So we must be optimistic. Jazakallah khair very much uh, for, your, uh, for your time today, Shaykh. Barakallahu feekum. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our efforts and grant us sincerity Amen. and uh, make these, all these engagements fruitful, inshallah. And we must invite you back to talk about Iqbal more, I think. Inshallah. Inshallah. Barakallah. If Allah permits, we will, inshallah. Inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Please remember to subscribe to our social media and YouTube channels and head over to our website thinkinmuslim.com to sign up to my weekly newsletter. Jazakallah khair.